In this video, I'm going to show you how you could build a $43 Rada Heart of Keld Commander deck. Let's get started. Total cost of this deck was just under $43 as of the day of recording. Prices were checked using mtgstocks.com. Do note that prices fluctuate, so they may be above or below where you see them listed at in this video. This deck is 1DH legal, meaning all the cards in the deck are $1 or under, with the exception of the commander, who can be up to $5. Rada Heart of Keld is a 3 to cast 3-3 that has first strike as long as it's our turn, and we can look at the top card of our library any time. We can also play lands off of the top of our library, and for 6 mana, Rada gets plus X plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of lands we control. So we're going to try to capitalize on that lands matter theme by pumping out tons of lands, being able to use them to pump Rada up, and then hopefully get some Voltron kills on our opponents. A Voltron KO just means that we dealt 21 points of commander damage to an opponent, which is also one of the multiple ways that we can knock an opponent out of the game. This deck rarely misses on land drops and even if we do we have a bunch of other ways that we're able to pull lands out of our library and put them directly onto the battlefield and should rata be removed too many times we also have 17 mana sinks so that we have a way to utilize all that extra mana with all of those mana sinks we're going to run a bunch of accelerants we have 13 in this deck all of our accelerants help us to cheat extra lands onto the battlefield early. We have sorceries such as Search for Tomorrow, Rampant Growth, and Farseek, all of which get us one land to the battlefield early. Search for Tomorrow we can suspend, so it only costs one, and Farseek can only get us a mountain. Cultivate and Nissus Pilgrimage each get us two lands, one to our hand and one to the battlefield. Nissus Pilgrimage can only get forests, but has the upside of potentially getting us three should we have Spell Mastery. And then we have the Font of Fertility, an enchantment that lets us pay in installments to cheat an extra land onto the battlefield as long as we sacrifice it. Similar to the Font of Fertility, we have three creatures that sacrifice themselves to get lands to the battlefield early, which make for great chump blockers. Sakura Tribe Elder, Diligent Farmhand, and the Dawn Treader Elk. As well as a few creatures that get us lands when they enter the battlefield, like Spring Bloom Druid and Wood Elves. And also the Viridian Emissary, which can get us a land when it dies, which makes for a great chump blocker. Do note that the Wood Elves will only get us a forest. Lastly, for Accelerants, we have the Beanstalk Giant, which you're going to want to send on an adventure, fetching a land to the battlefield, and then putting the Giant into exile, allowing us to cast it from exile, giving us a big beater. Next up, we're going to talk about the cards in our game plan. We have 12 cards specific to our game plan. First off, we're going to talk about the Boduka Gardener and Tarine Mauler. The Mauler just gets big gradually over the course of the game as our opponents cast spells. And then the Boduka Gardener, while it can help accelerate us because it can help us put lands from our hand directly onto the battlefield, as long as we control 10 or more lands, we get to flip the Gardener into Dokai, Weaver of Life. And then for 6 mana, we are able to create an XX Elemental Creature Token equal to the number of lands we control. Here we have a few creatures that get bigger based on the number of lands that we have in play. Scoop Mob requires us to have five, but it's gonna get four plus counters at the beginning of our upkeep if we hit that threshold. Woodborne Behemoth becomes an 8-8 with Trample if we have eight lands. And then the Crash of Rhino Beetles becomes a 15-15 with Trample as long as we have 10 or more lands. Here are a few cards that help pump up Rada or any of our other critical creatures. We have Rancor and Loxodon Warhammer, which give them a power boost, as well as Trample. Rancor can be returned to our hand if the creature it's on dies, and Loxodon Warhammer gives out lifelink. Fire Shrieker makes for a great offensive and defensive equipment, as we can swing in with the creature that has it, and then during our second main phase, re-equip it to an untapped creature, giving us a better blocker. Mirror Shield and Alpha Authority give Hexproof to our most important creatures, and Gaia's Embrace uh, does two things that we really like. Firstly, it gives Trample, which is important for Rada because while she can get really big, we need some kind of evasion for her, so giving her Trample is probably the best way in red-green. 
And then also it gives protection to whichever creature this is enchanting as we are able to pay a single green to regenerate that creature. For more protection we have Blossoming Defense and Ranger's Guile which can give us protection from targeted removal on our most important creature. Next up we're going to talk about the cards that interfere with our opponent's game plan. We have 21 cards that do that for us. Ground Assault and Struggle will deal damage to a creature equal to the number of lands we control. And then we have Thornado which will destroy a flyer or if there are no flyers on the battlefield that we want to get rid of, we can pay two to cycle it. Struggle also has the aftermath effect where we can cast it from our graveyard back into our library. While I didn't use this in playtesting, it's nice to have should you come up against a mill type strategy. Jaya's Immolating Inferno allows us to hit three targets for X, but it does require us to have a legendary on the battlefield. Rada is our only legendary aside from the gardener that flips into Dokai Weaver of Life. In playtesting, I didn't have a hard time casting the Inferno, but that does make it a little bit more challenging. Clan Defiance is very similar. It's going to deal X damage to three targets, but each of those targets has to be one flyer, one non-flyer, and one player. And then we also have Grab the Reins, which is going to be able to deal with two creatures for us. We're going to steal one of our opponent's biggest creatures, and then we're going to fling that creature at another creature, removing both of them at the same time. Flame Blast Dragon and Soul of Chandelar give us a place to dump a bunch of mana and deal damage to our opponents or their creatures. And then Fissure, which is a 5 to cast instant, so pretty expensive, but it does allow us to destroy target creature. In this deck we have a lot of damage based removal, and sometimes you just need to be able to destroy a creature. Nature's Claim, Slice and Twain, and Reclamation Sage help us destroy artifacts and enchantments. We also have Fade into Antiquity, Acidic Slime, and Return to Nature, which do the same. The Antiquity exiles that artifact or enchantment. The Slime allows us to also hit a land, and then Return to Nature allows us to hit a single target out of a graveyard. Horde Smelter Dragon is another place we can dump our mana to destroy our opponent's artifacts. And then we have Aftershock, which allows us to destroy an artifact, creature, or land, but it is going to deal 3 damage to us. We have a couple of board wipes in Chain Reaction and Starstorm, and then we also have Lord of Shatter Skull Pass, which is sort of a mini board wipe. It can come down on turn 4 or earlier as a 3-3, which makes for a good blocker. And then we can level it up into a 6-6 for just 2 mana. And then if we get to level 6 and attack with the Lord of Shatter Skull Pass, we're able to deal 6 damage to each creature the defending player controls, removing most if not all of their creatures. Next up, we're going to talk about the cards that provide consistency to this deck. We have 14 of them. We're going to start off with Explore, which draws us a card and hopefully ramps us by one. Not uncommon, as once we get Rada out, we're hopefully going to be playing lands off the top of our library, and we'll probably be accumulating some lands in our hands, so pretty easy to do. Crows and Tusker, I usually cycled, as it draws you a card and fetches you a land to your hand but you do have the option of playing it as a 6-5 creature for 7. And then Mass Admirers, which draws us a card when it enters, and we can also recur it from our graveyard for 2 green mana anytime we play a creature. Outpost Siege, you're probably going to want to choose Cons, which is going to give you some extra card advantage, as does Furious Rise and Colossal Majesty, as long as we have a creature with power 4 or greater on the battlefield. Arcane Encyclopedia and Seer Sundial is another place that we can dump our mana to get some extra card draw. And then we have Soul of the Harvest, which allows us to draw a card anytime a non-token creature enters the battlefield under our control. Genesis and Pulse of Marisa help us to recur creatures from our graveyard back to our hand. And the Charmbreaker Devils does the same, but for instants and sorceries. Hoarding Dragon allows us to pseudo tutor up a artifact. I was usually pulling out the mirror shield as it allowed me to protect Rada or some other piece, but we do need the Hoarding Dragon to die to get that card. So don't be afraid to throw it under the bus or swing into something because if this gets bounced or exiled, you won't have access to that card. And then of course we have Rada Heart of Keld, which provides us consistency in that we are able to play lands off the top of our deck. Lastly, we're going to talk about the lands in this deck. We have 40 of them. Bonders Enclave, Mosswarp Bridge, and Spine Rock Knoll 
get us card advantage. The Enclave, similar to a couple of our enchantments, requires us to have a creature with power 4 or greater. And then the Bridge and Knoll will hide away a card when they enter. And then should we hit their requirements, we're able to cast that card that we hit away for typically a reduced mana cost. Fuel of Ruin and Tectonic Edge help us to get rid of problematic lands. Maze of Ith was the most common occurrence for me as it removed Rada from combat, didn't allow her to deal combat, other players were saving each other. So if you see any Maze of Ith, destroy them on sight. And then we have Rogue's Passage which helps give unblockable to Rada or one of our other creatures. Another land that gives us evasion is Skarg the Rage Pits which gives plus one plus one and trample to a creature. We can also use this defensively pumping a creature up to allow us to either trade block or eat something. And then we have a couple of lands that fetch basics for us in Ash Barrens and Evolving Wilds. Command Tower, Gruel Turf, and Temple of Abandon give us red green, as does Kazandu Refuge and Rugged Highlands. As for basics, we're running 16 forests and 10 mountains. Average converted mana cost of this deck was 3.4. Keys to victory, ramp before you bring out Rada. I had the temptation to want to bring out Rada so I could get a look at the top and maybe play a land off of the top, even if I had ramp or lands in my hand. And games tended to not go as well for me there. Just play your ramp, play your things out, and then bring out Rada afterwards and hopefully get some get a little bit deeper into your deck. We also have to be really smart with our removal. Being in green red and 1dh we are quite limited in that a lot of our removal is damage based, it's at sorcery speed, and it had a high cost in terms of mana. Lastly was protection and evasion. I felt a lot better about getting Rada out if I had protection in my hand and also being able to give evasion to Rada through the form of trample or unblockable. Try not to be too hasty on getting Rada out once again and wait till you can maybe protect her unless you've got nothing else going on. I really enjoyed playing this deck. It's very simple in that you just put out a bunch of big creatures and swing at your opponents. But I also like that it could win through commander damage, which is not a typical path to victory for most commander decks. Here are a few cards I would consider if I were to go above that $1 price point. If you want to see some more ideas, check out the link in the description below. Better yet, share your thoughts in the comments what card you would upgrade with. That way, others can see your brilliant ideas and alter to their liking. If you liked the video, you should give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. If you do, make sure you ring the bell so you don't miss any of the new weekly content from Budget Commander. Otherwise, you can check out the video in the top right or either of the playlists on the bottom.